एग्जामिनेशन जो हमारा पीरियोडिक टू होगा एंड इन द पीरियोडिक टू एज यू कैन सी देर आर प्रेजेंटेशन दैट विल हैपन and in that we will evaluate on the basis of content your epistemic learning it means the basic knowledge you have of that particular topic aur ye sari cheezon ke basis par aap logon ka evaluation hoga and plus there will be a short oral test as well and the way i will i'll just am i audible Yes, 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 yes. I'll make it plain and simple. Lottery system hoga and I'll just pick up a roll number और जिसका roll number आएगा they will have to present. If you are not present in the class, आपको दूसरा chance नहीं मिलेगा If you are taking a leave, your applications must go to your class teacher before the class is conducted. Class हो जाने के बाद फिर आप बहाने नहीं बना पाएंगे Why you were not present? आपका रोल नंबर आता है यू शुड प्रेजेंट समथिंग बेटा आई कॉन्ट हियर यू प्रॉपरली प्लीज राइट इट इन दैट बॉक्स तुम्हारी आवाज नहीं आ रही है मुझे Other than that, anybody has any question? Yes, Adya Shah. Ma'am, actually, there was a network problem. I was not able to hear. Peer teaching, ma'am. You were talking about presentation. Yes, peer teaching. Only peer means you have to teach to your fellow classmates. I will evaluate on that basis. एक छोटा सा टॉपिक लेंगे उसको अच्छे से एक्सप्लेन करेंगे मिनिमम टाइम फाइव मिनट्स मैक्सिमम टाइम टेन मिनट्स डू नॉट एक्सीड टू मच छोटा टॉपिक लेके उसे प्रॉपरली एक्सप्लेन करें दैट शुड बी योर फोकस आई थिंक वी ऑलरेडी डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड द चैप्टर्स फॉर दिस वन You can take the topics of the chapters जो मैंने नहीं पढ़ाए हैं वो भी आप ले सकते हो but it should be correct. It will be of फोर्टी marks and these फोर्टी marks are very important for you. They can be very easily achieved if you work properly. और next class से ये evaluation शुरू हो जाएगा I think next class हमारी Friday को है तो फ्राइडे से ये प्रेजेंटेशन शुरू हो जाएंगे आई रिपीट वंस मोर इफ योर रूम नंबर कम्स एंड इफ यू आर नॉट प्रेजेंट इन द क्लास यू विल बी गिवन जीरो देर विल बी नो सेकेंड चांसेस फॉर दैट यस एनी क्वेश्चंस बाय एनीवन आई विल टेल यू योर नेम आल्सो विद द रोल नंबर ना आई नो योर रोल नंबर anything else if you have to ask something ask it now presentation shuru hone ke baad main tum logo ke queries solve nahi karungi yes you can take any topic see you have to teach that topic completely suppose if you are trying to teach the conventional sources of energy तो कन्वेंशनल सोर्सेज ऑफ एनर्जी में यू कैन स्टार्ट विद ऑल द कन्वेंशनल सोर्सेज इन शॉर्ट यू कैन एक्सप्लेन देम ऑल और डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ कल्चर एग्रीकल्चर सेरीकल्चर पिसी कल्चर हॉर्टिकल्चर नेक्स्ट क्लास आई थिंक इट्स ऑन फ्राइडे मेरी नेक्स्ट क्लास से मैं तो इवेल्युएशन शुरू कर रही हूँ और आज के एजेंडा में क्या था पहले हम लोगों ने क्या डिसाइड किया था क्या करना है हम 
what did we have for today and chapter number 4 of geography agriculture acha we had to start a new chapter but i am not willing to start a new chapter right now because we have examination pending to beech mein chhodenge to acha nahi rahega so if there is anything you wish to ask abhi tak jo chapter padhe hain unse kuch bhi related question hai koi query hai exam se related koi query hai to puch lo there is there are a few videos that i found on internet and i think you will like them so since you do not have any questions let's have a look at them yes nandini pucho ma'am hum history geography still hum kisi se bhi ek chapter le sakte hai na ma'am bilkul le sakte ho koi dikkat nahi hai If you cannot hear the video properly, just rejoin the meeting. Every year, the world uses thirty-five billion barrels of oil. This massive scale of fossil fuel dependence pollutes the earth and it won't last forever. Scientists estimate that we've consumed about 40% of the world's oil. According to present estimates, at this rate we'll run out of oil and gas in 50 years or so and in about a century for coal. On the flip side, we have abundant sun, water and wind. These are renewable energy sources, meaning that we won't use them up over time. What if we could exchange our fossil fuel dependence for an existence based solely on renewables? We've pondered that question for decades, and yet renewable energy still only provides about 13% of our needs. That's because reaching 100% requires renewable energy that's inexpensive and accessible. This represents a huge challenge, even if we ignore the politics involved and focus on the science and engineering. We can better understand the problem by understanding how we use energy. Global energy use is a diverse and complex system, and the different elements require their own solutions. But for now, we'll focus on two of the most familiar in everyday life: electricity and liquid fuels. Electricity powers blast furnaces, elevators, computers, and all manner of things in homes, businesses, and manufacturing. Meanwhile, liquid fuels play a crucial role in almost all forms of transportation. Let's consider the electrical portion first. The great news is that our technology is already advanced enough to capture all that energy from renewables, and there's an ample supply. The sun continuously radiates about 173 quadrillion watts of solar energy at the earth. which is almost 10,000 times our present needs. It's been estimated that a surface that spans several hundred thousand kilometers would be needed to power humanity at our present usage levels. So why don't we build that? Because there are other hurdles in the way, like efficiency and energy transportation. 
To maximize efficiency, solar plants must be located in areas with lots of sunshine year-round, like deserts. But those are far away from densely populated regions, where energy demand is high. There are other forms of renewable energy we could draw from, such as hydroelectric, geothermal, and biomasses, but they also have limits based on availability and location. In principle, a connected electrical energy network with power lines crisscrossing the globe would enable us to transport power from where it's generated to where it's needed. But building a system on this scale faces an astronomical price tag. We could lower the cost by developing advanced technologies to capture energy more efficiently. The infrastructure for transporting energy would also have to change drastically. Present-day power lines lose about 6 to 8 percent of the energy they carry because wire material dissipates energy through resistance. Longer power lines would mean more energy loss. Superconductors could be one solution. Such materials can transport electricity without dissipation. Unfortunately, they only work if cooled to low temperatures, which requires energy and defeats the purpose. To benefit from that technology, we'd need to discover new superconducting materials that operate at room temperature. And what about the all-important oil-derived liquid fuels? The scientific challenge there is to store renewable energy in an easily transportable form. Recently, we've gotten better at producing lithium-ion batteries, which are lightweight and have high energy density. But even the best of these store about 2.5 megajoules per kilogram. That's about 20 times less than the energy in one kilogram of gasoline. To be truly competitive, car batteries would have to store much more energy without adding cost. The challenges only increase for bigger vessels like ships and planes. To power a cross-Atlantic flight for a jet, we'd need a battery weighing about 1,000 tons. This, too, demands a technological leap towards new materials, higher energy density, and better storage. One promising solution would be to find efficient ways to convert solar into chemical energy. This is already happening in labs, but the efficiency is still too low to allow it to reach the market. To find novel solutions, we'll need lots of creativity, innovation, and powerful incentives. The transition towards all renewable energies is a complex problem involving technology, economics, and politics. Priorities on how to tackle this challenge depend on the specific assumptions we have to make when trying to solve such a multifaceted problem. But there's ample reason to be optimistic that we'll get there. Top scientific minds around the world are working on these problems and making breakthroughs all the time. And many governments and businesses are investing in technologies that harness the energy all around us. TED-Ed is a nonprofit. If you value our work, please... living tree on the planet. Nicknamed General Sherman, this giant sequoia has sequestered roughly 1,400 tons of atmospheric carbon over its estimated 2,500 years on Earth. Very few trees can compete with this carbon impact, but today, humanity produces more than 1,400 tons of carbon every minute. To combat climate change, we need to steeply reduce fossil fuel emissions and draw down excess CO2 
to restore our atmosphere's balance of greenhouse gases. But what can trees do to help in this fight? And how do they sequester carbon in the first place? Like all plants, trees consume atmospheric carbon through a chemical reaction called photosynthesis. This process uses energy from sunlight to convert water and carbon dioxide into oxygen and energy-storing carbohydrates. Plants then consume these carbohydrates in a reverse process called respiration, converting them to energy and releasing carbon back into the atmosphere. In trees, however, a large portion of that carbon isn't released and instead is stored as newly formed wood tissue. During their lifetimes, trees act as carbon vaults and they continue to draw down carbon for as long as they grow. However, when a tree dies and decays, some of its carbon will be released back into the air. A significant amount of CO2 is stored in the soil, where it can remain for thousands of years. But eventually, that carbon also seeps back into the atmosphere. So if trees are going to help fight a long-term problem like climate change, they need to survive to sequester their carbon for the longest period possible, while also reproducing quickly. Is there one type of tree we could plant that meets these criteria? Some fast-growing, long-lived, super-sequestering species we could scatter worldwide. Not that we know of, but even if such a tree existed, it wouldn't be a good long-term solution. Forests are complex networks of living organisms, and there's no one species that can thrive in every ecosystem. The most sustainable trees to plant are always native ones, species that already play a role in their local environment. Preliminary research shows that ecosystems with a naturally occurring diversity of trees have less competition for resources and better resist climate change. This means we can't just plant trees to draw down carbon. We need to restore depleted ecosystems. There are numerous regions that have been clear-cut or developed that are ripe for restoring. In 2019, a study led by Zurich's Crowther Lab analyzed satellite imagery of the world's existing tree cover. By combining it with climate and soil data and excluding areas necessary for human use, they determined Earth could support nearly 1 billion hectares of additional forest. That's roughly 1.2 trillion trees. This staggering number surprised the scientific community, prompting additional research. Scientists now cite a more conservative but still remarkable figure. By their revised estimates, these restored ecosystems could capture anywhere from 100 to 200 billion tons of carbon, accounting for over one-sixth of humanity's carbon emissions. More than half of the potential forest canopy for new restoration efforts can be found in just six countries, and the study can also provide insight into existing restoration projects, like the Bond Challenge, which aims to restore 350 million hectares of forest by 2030. But this is where it gets complicated. Ecosystems are incredibly complex, and it's unclear whether they're best restored by human intervention. It's possible the right thing to do for certain areas is to simply leave them alone. Additionally, some researchers worry that restoring forests on this scale may have unintended consequences, like producing natural biochemicals at a pace that could actually accelerate climate change. And even if we succeed in restoring these areas, future generations would need to protect them from the natural and economic forces that previously depleted them. Taken together, these challenges have damaged confidence in restoration projects worldwide. And the complexity of rebuilding ecosystems demonstrates how important it is to protect our existing forests. But hopefully, restoring some of these depleted regions will give us the data and conviction necessary to combat climate change on a larger scale. If we get it right, maybe these modern trees will have time to grow into carbon-carrying titans. But exactly how tall can a tree grow? If there's plenty of sun and carbon, what...
will be preferable if you do it with a PPT. PPT में easily मुझे marks देने में आसानी रहेगी. Chart work जो है हम लोग दिवाली के बाद देख लेते हैं. अगर अगर आपका complete हो गया तो आप मुझे email कर सकते हैं आज ही. प्रांजल थोड़ा सा ध्यान दो कि हो क्या रहा है अभी. कैसे evaluation हो रहा है. जितने चैप्टर पढ़ाए हैं एवरीथिंग इज गेम फॉर ओरल टेस्ट जो पढ़ाया है उसमें से किसी भी चीज का ओरल टेस्ट हो सकता है जो आ चुका है एग्जाम में उसका भी और जो उसके आबाद पढ़ाया है उसका भी क्योंकि मैं मान के चल रही हूँ कि जिसका आप एग्जाम दे चुके हैं वो तो आपको ऑलरेडी आता है और उसके बाद ज्यादा कुछ हुआ नहीं है येस यू कैन डू दैट इट शुड बी क्लियर Scan it and send it to me. That scan will be more clear and easier to evaluate. Anything else? Yes, Tanisha. मैम हमें पीपीटी के फॉर्म में एक चैप्टर एक्सप्लेन करना है पर मैम वो चैप्टर तो बहुत सा बड़ा होगा तो आप पार्ट्स में डिवाइड करोगे उसे बेटा मैंने आपके ऊपर छोड़ दिया है कि आप उस चैप्टर का कोई सा भी पार्ट लेके एक्सप्लेन करिए मेरे लिए ये जरूरी नहीं है कि आपने एग्जैक्टली exactly क्या लिया मेरे लिए ये जरूरी है कि आपने जो भी लिया वो आपने कितना अच्छे से एक्सप्लेन किया आई एम नॉट पुटिंग प्रेशर ऑन एनी वन की ये ही करना है या इसको ऐसे ही करना है इट इज अप टू यू जो आपको ईजी लग रहा है जो आपको अच्छा लग रहा है मुझे आपकी स्किल चेक करनी है कि आप कितनी ईजिली सामने वाले को पढ़ा सकते हो मेरा फोकस इस चीज पर है समझो एग्जाम का पीछे एग्जाम के पीछे आइडिया क्या है आपकी उस टॉपिक को लेके कितनी बेसिक अंडरस्टैंडिंग है मुझे आपकी अंडरस्टैंडिंग चेक करनी है बिल्कुल एट द रूट लेवल एनीथिंग एल्स ओके फाइन लेट्स वॉट वन मोर वीडियो आई फॉर्म आई एम लाइकिंग दैट वन टू and there is a link that i have sent to all of you on the class group national unity day quiz hai agar aap usme 75 se zyada score karte hain 75% se you will get bonus marks here as well but participation is compulsory sabke mujhe certificate email id par mere aane chahiye jitna jaldi ho sake so just check that out and do that Mexican farmer Dionisio Pulido thought he heard thunder coming from his cornfield. However, the sound wasn't coming from the sky. The source was a large smoking crack emitting gas and ejecting rocks. This fissure would come to be known as the volcano Paracutin, and over the next In years, its lava and ash would cover over 200 square kilometers. But where did this new volcano come from, and what triggered its unpredictable eruption? The story of any volcano begins with magma. Often, this molten rock forms in areas where ocean water is able to slip into the Earth's mantle and lower the layer's melting point. The resulting magma typically remains under the Earth's surface thanks to the delicate balance of three geological factors. 
The first is lithostatic pressure. This is the weight of the Earth's crust pushing down on the magma below. Magma pushes back with the second factor, magmastatic pressure. The battle between these forces strains the third factor, the rock strength of the Earth's crust. Usually, the rock is strong enough and heavy enough to keep the magma in place. But when this equilibrium is thrown off, the consequences can be explosive. One of the most common causes of an eruption is an increase in magma static pressure. Magma contains various elements and compounds, many of which are dissolved in the molten rock. At high enough concentrations, compounds like water or sulfur no longer dissolve and instead form high-pressure gas bubbles. When these bubbles reach the surface, they can burst with the force of a gunshot. And when millions of bubbles explode simultaneously, the energy can send plumes of ash into the stratosphere. But before they pop, they act like bubbles of CO2 in a shaken soda. Their presence lowers the magma's density and increases the buoyant force pushing upward through the crust. Many geologists believe this process was behind the Paracutin eruption in Mexico. There are two known natural causes for these buoyant bubbles. Sometimes, new magma from deeper underground brings additional gassy compounds into the mix. But bubbles can also form when magma begins to cool. In its molten state, magma is a mixture of dissolved gases and melted minerals. As the molten rock hardens, some of those minerals solidify into crystals. This process doesn't incorporate many of the dissolved gases, resulting in a higher concentration of the compounds that form explosive bubbles. Not all eruptions are due to rising magmastatic pressure. Sometimes the weight of the rock above can become dangerously low. Landslides can remove massive quantities of rock from atop a magma chamber, dropping the lithostatic pressure and instantly triggering an eruption. This process is known as unloading, and it's been responsible for numerous eruptions, including the sudden explosion of Mount St. Helens in 1980. But unloading can also happen over longer periods of time due to erosion or melting glaciers. In fact, many geologists are worried that glacial melt caused by climate change could increase volcanic activity. Finally, eruptions can occur when the rock layer is no longer strong enough to hold back the magma below. Acidic gases and heat escaping from magma can corrode rock through a process called hydrothermal alteration, gradually turning hard stone into soft clay the rock layer could also be weakened by tectonic activity. Earthquakes can create fissures, allowing magma to escape to the surface, and the Earth's crust can be stretched thin as continental plates shift away from each other. Unfortunately, knowing what causes eruptions doesn't make them easy to predict. While scientists can roughly determine the strength and weight of the Earth's crust, the depth and heat of magma chambers makes measuring changes in magmastatic pressure very difficult. But volcanologists are constantly exploring new technology to conquer this rocky terrain. Advances in thermal imaging have allowed scientists to detect subterranean hotspots. Spectrometers can analyze gases escaping magma, and lasers can precisely track the impact of rising magma on a volcano's shape. Hopefully, these tools will help us better understand these volatile vents and their explosive eruptions. Did you know that there's an even more explosive and destructive kind of volcano known as a supervolcano? 650. Okay, so be prepared with uh, your presentations. Yes, Adyasha, Puchi. Ma'am, in the video, it showed that melting of glacier or ice capes can cause volcanic activity, ma'am, how? It changes the structure of Earth, ma'am. 
see when the ocean uh, when the glaciers are melting basically temperature change ho raha hai uski wajah se crust mein effect aa raha hai crust mein effect aa raha hai uski wajah se magma static pressure it changes and when it changes then there is a chance that volcanic eruption might happen ma'am what causes the uh, pressure the magma static pressure there are a lot of factors so pure video mein bahut sare factors bata raha tha na bhai dekho मैग्मा है मैग्मा अर्थ के अंदर है उसके अंदर जो है इरप्शन हो रहा है उसके अंदर प्रेशर बढ़ता है उसकी डेंसिटी में चेंज आता है जैसे कि उसने बताया कि सोडा की जो बॉटल होती है जो कोल्ड ड्रिंक की बॉटल होती है उसे अगर आप शेक करेंगे तो उसमें धीरे धीरे बबल्स जो है ऊपर उठने लग जाते हैं सिमिलर काइंड ऑफ चेंजेस हैपन इन द अर्थ क्रस्ट एज वेल अर्थ का रोटेशन हो रहा है देर आर अलॉट ऑफ नेचुरल प्रोसेस है आर नॉट एग्जैक्टली प्रिसाइज कोई मैथमेटिकल कैलकुलेशन नहीं है उसका बट बिकॉज ऑफ दो चेंजेस अलॉट ऑफ चेंजेस इन द अर्थ दिस इज वन ऑफ दैम मूविंग ऑफ टेक्टोनिक प्लेट्स भी Yes, moving of tectonic plates basically they are the main reason for earthquakes, but they also affect the volcanic eruptions. ठीक है, so that will be all for today. Thank you, Sairam, and be prepared with your presentations in the next class.